myself that, uh, because he's modest, that I'd like to tell you, and not just to praise Dr. Robertson, because I think that, that one reason that you're here and, and that staff is here uh, and, and that uh, you've made this long trip is his passion is to let you know that even though he faced a tremendous number of hurdles as a young man, uh, this institution was a key element for him being able to springboard into the things that he did in life. And I had I'd been working at Bluefield State for, oh, just a few years, and had begun to learn a little bit about its history. The college is the only institution in the state that came into law without the governor signing the bill that brought it into law. It, uh, in those days, if a bill passed both the House and the Senate, it could sit on the governor's desk for 60 days, and if he didn't veto it and didn't sign it, it became law without his signature. And the tenor of the times in 1895 was such that the southern West Virginia coal mine operators knew that they had to have African American labor in order to make the mines their most profitable. And there were a lot of black coal miners who with their families were displaced from Alabama and the Deep South and brought to southern West Virginia for that. The coal miners knew that it was a terrible existence. They were being paid in scrip instead of money and you had to spend the scrip in a company store. So the company basically kept all the money and they charged so much that the miners were in an almost inescapable, if, if it wasn't slavery, it was the first cousin to it. Right. Hmm. And so these, these men knew that if short term they pushed back too hard, there wasn't any place to go for their families, but they wanted there to be a place to go for their sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters. So they pressed the coal mine operators and they said, the only way that we're going to stay here, even under these brutal circumstances, is if there is a school, and remember this is during the, the midst of a very segregated era in our nation, uh, and, and particularly in, in the southern coal fields, that will allow, this school will train young black men and women to become teachers so that then they can come back and train the children of these coal miners because education is the key. Education is colorblind. And so that was the reason that Bluefield State was created. The southern coal operators pressed the governor to sign the bill. The northern whites in many cases pushed back against the bill being signed because they said there's one school for, for blacks in the state. We don't need a second one, which was pretty backward thinking. So the governor didn't want to alienate either party, and he didn't have the courage to sign the bill and do the right thing, so he just let it become law without it being passed. And what they did, this was a high-graded school at first because you had to take students through the upper grades of school, and then it, it morphed into a college after that point. But in our first, I think it was eight years of existence, Jim, that after the initial uh, appropriation of around $10,000, college didn't get any more money. And one of the reasons we have engineering technology today is that its antecedent was called industrial arts. And the young men who came here had to learn how to build the buildings that they would live in and study in. And, and the young ladies who came here had to learn how to prepare meals and do things of that nature so that there would be a place to exist. So the college learned how to survive on its own without any more money from the state after the initial outlay of 8000 or so dollars. So it became very resilient during that time. And if you fast forward to the 1950s, I'll tell you a story about a, a young man who came up from the Roanoke Valley, very nervous. I don't think he'd been that far away from home at any point previously. And he came to Bluefield because there were a lot of great things happening at this teacher, what was then just moving beyond a teacher's college. And when he got here, he realized that, you know, I don't have the, the very best suits to wear like many of the other young men and young ladies who come here. Don't really have a whole lot of money in order to make ends meet. And he was homesick and very far away from home. And, and when he got here, he said, man, I'm, I'm completely in the wrong place. And so he went down to the train station and was going to take whatever resources he had left, buy a ticket, and go back home. He said, I can't make it. This place is, there's too many. It wasn't a fancy cars and big cigars place, but it was a whole lot uh, 
more affluent than he thought he was going to be able to afford. And even more than that, he was a little bit intimidated academically because the teachers demanded excellence. And he was away from home when it was first time. There were just a lot of pressures on him. Well, as he was there, waiting for the train, having already gotten the ticket, or waiting for the, at some point waiting to get on the train, there was what he later described as the longest car he had ever seen. And it drove to the train station. And a very large man, an overwhelming presence, who was our president at the time, Henry Lake Dickinson, drove up. And he inquired of the young man, you know, did, did, this was a college-age young man. He may have recognized him from being on campus. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm just in the wrong place. I can't, can't make it up there. That's for, for individuals who are probably smarter, who are certainly better off financially. Uh, and it just, uh, it's not for me. And he said, young man, get in the car. And this young man, those years ago, did. And came back and he said, you know, get yourself a couple meals, come in and see me on Monday morning, and we'll straighten this whole thing out. And so he did. And he didn't give him a handout, he gave him a hand up. He got him started and he networked him to other individuals whom he could shadow, who could kind of show him the ropes. And, and I learned that story in 2000 because one of the other things that happened in the 1960s, and Bluefield had significant numbers of, of human, not human rights, but, but civil rights violations and issues. I can remember as a kid the swimming pool that I swam in in 1964, was closed because an order came down from the government, it has to integrate. And I didn't mind. I didn't, you know, what difference did it make to me? I had a pool. I wanted other kids to have the same fun. I did black, white, it didn't matter. But I was friends of the sons of the guy who was the mayor. And he very proudly proclaimed, he said, we got the order to integrate the city pool, and by God, we just closed it. So he was proud of it. And I was thinking, how can you celebrate something like that? Well, in the midst of all that, the Kresge's department store in downtown Bluefield, and Bluefield used to have around 25,000 people in it, they had said, if we have to integrate our, our cafeteria, our, our, our lunch, lunch bar, then we'll close as opposed to doing it. They resisted it. They wouldn't serve student, individuals of color during that time. And there was a faculty member here who was probably at first glance, the sternest, most demanding faculty member that has taught here in 115 years. Her name was, 116. Her name was Othello Mariah Harris Jefferson. And she didn't compromise on excellence. She challenged you and she built the bridge that you had to cross. But when she was having her students do bulletin boards in class, she'd tear them down if they didn't look good enough. She made them do it over and over again and as a result, the students who studied under her went on to great careers in administration because they only knew excellence. That's all she would, would accept. She had an aesthetics club where she would, it was basically a drama club, and she taught these young men and women how to be expressive and how to shape their thoughts and, and how to project and present themselves. And in the 90s, I guess it was, Bluefield State's Alumni Association had a reunion in Roanoke. And we went to Camp Virginia JC, and I got to meet this gentleman for the first time at that time. And he told me at that point, he said, you know, the one passion that I have about Bluefield State that really hadn't been fulfilled to this point has been there's not a facility, there's not a building named in honor of Miss Jefferson. And she put her thumbprint on so many of us through the years because she didn't compromise on excellence. And so I can remember as we uh, approached 2000 and the Alumni Association was going to have a reunion in Bluefield. They meet every, every second year. Our president said, you know, we do have a building on campus that's not named, and it's a student center. And I thought from discussions with Dr. Roberts, I said how appropriate that would be because she was so student-centered. What better thing to do than name the student center after somebody who was student-centered? So I mentioned it to him, and, and, and he took it from there and, and got it passed by our board and, and other folks and, and, and so forth. He, he rolled it out. And before the official announcement came out, I said there's one individual that I need to call, because I asked for the honor of calling. And I was able to, to make that call. And he was almost moved to tears. He was choked up and, and very emotional. So he came up in 2000 for the official dedication of the Othello Mariah Harris Jefferson Student Center. And we'll visit that in just a little while. But I learned of his passion for the institution. And then a few years passed, and he'd relocated in, in Tampa, 13571 Avista. Yes. 
Tampa. Drive, okay. That's it. In Tampa. And, and I'd stayed in touch with Tampa because there's a, a former Bluefielder who coaches at Posco Hernando Community College <coughs> in basketball, Bobby Bowman, who's kind of a legend. And a lot of the Princeton Rays baseball players, which is about 12 miles away, made it to the major leagues with Tampa. So I kind of followed their careers during that period of time. And then began to see things anecdotally about this gentleman who always dressed very correctly, always had his, his lapel handkerchief tucked in neatly, who was communicating that same yes you can message to another generation of students. And that's how I found out where you had moved from that point, not directly, but indirectly, because when you do the right things, people find out about it, and you impact people for the right reasons. So as he's come back today, it's an honor for me to be able to share that story, and I know I've talked for quite a long time, and I apologize for that. But I think it's really important that you understand the fabric of Bluefield State College is individuals like Dr. Robertson. And the whole reason that he's here is to say you can too. He believes in you enough to, to do this, and so do the, the folks from his staff who've come up here, that they believe enough in you. And that ought to be uh, uh, any time that the things shake underneath you, you ought to say, you know, I, my foundation is not based on what happens today or tomorrow, but it's based on the fact that there is something within me that inspires the belief that these people that I think so much about have invested in me and draw from that during those times. Thank you all.